I'm proud to introduce you to our next speaker. Um, Dr. Lechner has studied dental medicine in Munich, Germany since 1980 with a main emphasis on holistic systemic dentistry. He served as a board member, member of several medical associations of integrative medicine. He has lectured extensively and published several articles and books in Germany and abroad. Please give a welcome to Dr. Uh, Lechner. Thank you. Thank you, Janet, for this introduction. Well, two years ago at an IAOMT meeting in St. Louis, I had the privilege to present a study about the, in, uh, about the relationship of NICO and inflammatory mediator, mediators uh, only with six cases. In these two years, we have been busy, and I'm glad to present you today a study with more than 30 cases, more than 30 samples. The basic question stays the same. The question is, does uh, jawbone cavitation, do jawbone ca cavitations or NICO uh, produce inflammatory cytokines which event eventually are triggers for systemic disease? And what you can see on this picture is not the complicated networking of cytokines, this is a view into a Bavarian beer tent on the famous Oktoberfest in Munich, and it's more a psycho-emotional networking here than a medical one. I try to proceed with the picture. The wheel. The wheel. Just a, it's just a downwards. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Wrong direction. Now, <clears throat> this is our subject of interest. Here we see an X-ray, and if you look at this area here, it looks totally inconspicuous. If you do a surgery there, you find the spongial bone, the spongial marrow area, totally softened. And what you can take out is a substance like this. This is fatty degenerated spongial uh, material. This is jelly-like. This is fat. And here we filled in a contrast medium to show the extent of this softened spongial area. This is the picture, the pathohistological picture. And in more than 2,000 pathohistological findings over the last few years, it's always the same finding. It is, we, f we find pools of liquefied fat, similar to oil cysts. We find residual fatty degenerated marrow. And of course, these fatty parts of the marrow uh, are the reasons why the spongial bone there is totally soft. The structure is not hard. This is a microscopic view, <clears throat> and you see the glittering and glancing fat here. And uh, <clears throat> the question now is, does these fatty structures, do they have any connections to general health? And quite simply what we did, we took the Luminex machine, which is produced in Austin, Texas, and we analyzed these samples, these fatty degenerated bone samples we took out from these knee collisions. We checked them for inflammatory cytokines. <clears throat> and here is the outcome. You see the blue uh, the graph is the other cytokines in these in 31 NICO cases. These uh, 31 NICO cases had all uh, systemic diseases, uh, ALS, MS, breast cancer, and so on, and, and, and so on. We compare these 31 NICO cases 
with three cases of normal jawbone. We have only three cases of normal jawbone because the question is, where do we get normal, healthy jawbone from uh, for ethical reasons? We took it from implants, when we they, uh, do implants into healthy bone, we took these samples. <clears throat> Notwithstanding this limitation of three cases, we compared the cytokine contents of these 31 NICO cases with these three normal cases. And this is the outcome. We find high interleukine 1 receptor antagonist. This is all pretty low. These levels are very low. Even TNF-alpha, tumor necrosis alpha, because in the beginning of our study, we expected TNF-alpha high. Because as dentists, we know TNF-alpha is high in inflammatory processes like uh, periodontal diseases, but not in NICO. What was really striking high is a so-called chemokine, a pro-inflammatory cytokine with the name of Rantus. It's that high in all in the, in the average of these 31 cases. And another one is fibroblast growth factor 2, which is also very high. And if you compare the level of Rantus with the level of Rantus in healthy bone, it's an amazing difference. So <clears throat> we concentrated in the first interpretation of these phenomena on Rantus. Now, our hypothesis was which derived from these results, fatty tissue and the uh, adipocytes in the NICO create runters. So we know that fat cells are triggers of so-called silent inflammations. This is discussed in general medicine. This is the reason why we should not be obese, because fat cells release inflammatory cytokines. This is well known in medicine. Interestingly, there is a difference in cytokine patterns of body fat and in the cytokine uh, patterns of uh, the NICO. That means obesity has always increased level of TNF-alpha and interleukin-6. Neither interleukin-6 nor TNF-alpha are found in the 31 NICO samples. That's interesting. That means eventually we approach a totally new area which is similar to silent inflammation in obesity, but it's something new. Now, when we concentrate on Rantus, we have to look what is Rantus. Rantus is a chemotactic cytokine. And if you go to liter literature, uh, there is a lot of interesting information. <clears throat> Rantus can have detrimental effects via the recruitment of immune cells that enhance inflammatory processes such as arthritis, atopic dermatitis, nephritis, colitis, and other disorders like arteriosclerosis, pulmonary hypertension, asthma, nasal polyps, and so on and so on, and perhaps Alzheimer's disease. So, Rantus can be responsible for a wide range of different diseases. Or, Rantus targets the central nervous system and is able to cause multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's disease. In targeting, in targeting mast cells, Rantus causes allergies, alopecia, <clears throat> and thyroid disorders. So far, uh, just part of the international scientific literature about Rantus. Now, <clears throat> as we had eight from these 31 patients where we took the NICO samples, we had eight patients with breast cancer. And so we uh, checked each one of these breast cancer patients for cytokines, for Rantus, in their NICO areas. Uh, where we did the surgery. So here is the median of these three normal spongy bone samples we had. And these are one, two, three, four, five different, uh, seven patients with breast cancer. And their median content of Rantus 
in the NICO uh, samples is 4,558. Compared to this normal, it's a huge difference. That means patients without breast cancer have 181 picogram per milliliter runtus in jawbone. Patients with breast cancer, they, they have 4,558 picogram per milliliter in their NICO areas. This is a dramatic difference. Now, <clears throat> let's check what does the literature know and tell us about Rantus and its role in breast cancer. So, <clears throat> this is, uh, you see, this is always a very uh, high standard of uh, literature. Rantus has been associated as well with the induction or promotion of cancer, Ig prostate and breast, or development of breast cancer is the potential ability of Rantus to act directly on the tumor cells and to promote progression of the tumor. Or analysis of Rantus expression demonstrates that expression of Rantus in breast tumor cells is elevated significantly. That means in breast tumor cells in breast tumor cells themselves, we also have high levels of Rantus. And breast tumor cell derived Rantus may promote breast cancer progression. That means the breast cancer cells produce runtus and this may promote the breast cancer progression. Oh, this is quite interesting information. Now, <clears throat> in this graph, you see a breast cancer patient number eight. These are the seven breast cancer patients as before. Here we see the levels of the fibroblast growth factor 2, FGF2. And here we have the mean of now eight breast cancer patients is 5737 picograms compared with this in the normal jawbone. And why is this patient very interesting? Because <clears throat> when we got back the pathohistological finding from the uh, pathologist, he found breast cancer metastasis inside this NICO sample we sent to him. Parallel to this, this NICO sample has a runtus contents of more than 10,000 picograms per milliliter. The Luminex machine goes only up to 10,000. So this is more than the Luminex machine <coughs> can indicate. So, this is the case, this breast cancer case with breast cancer metastasis in the jawbone. This is the X-ray, which is not from us, the quality is not so good. But based on this X-ray, all the dentists before that know there is no disturbance field, there is no inflammatory process in the jawbone, there is no NICO. You know, we use the good old cavitat machine to diagnose or to measure the density of the jawbone there, and you see the outcome. <clears throat> it's a clear indication for us to clean this site. This is the cone beam, and on the cone beam, here you see the mandibular nerve canal. Well, the interpretation it's pretty difficult. If you know about NICO, you can say yes. Here you see uh, the dissolved spongial bone with no structures in it. But if you don't know what NICO is, you say this is also quite a normal uh, cone beam <clears throat> X-ray. But nevertheless, in this area, we had the osteolith osteolithic metastasis of the adenocarcinoma of her uh, right breast. This is the, the picture the pathologist uh, sent us, and it's quite interesting because here we have a close uh, neighborhood of these tumor cells. These are tumor cells. And 
just beside the tumor cells, you find these typical uh, oil cysts, you, uh, these pools of li liquefied uh, marrow. And the question is, here we have the necrotic atiposite, <clears throat> which are the source of Rantus and FGF2, uh, and just beside them we have the tumor cells. Well, this is just an interesting coincidence. And uh, if you look at this case especially, we have Rantus that high in this case, and all the other cytokines and immune mediators are very, very low. So in the whole NICO affair, all these cytokines are, you can neglect them. They are not playing an important role in NICO. FGF2, the fibroblast growth factor 2, is also high, but not as high as Arantus. If you compare of this patient with the metastasis, we compare NICO, this is the NICO profile, and this is the profile of our three normal jawbone samples. And you see <clears throat> FGF2, uh, FGF uh, uh, is 18.8, and here we have 400, and here we have 181, and here we have more than 10,000. <clears throat> now, what does literature say about the role of Rantus in breast cancer metastasis? Uh, Rantus can also increase the metastatic potential of cancer cells. Oh, Rantus eventually changes normal cancer cells into metastasizing cells. Or breast cancer cells stimulate secretion of Rantus from mesenchymal stem cells, uh, from mesenchymal stem cells, which then acts on cancer cells to enhance their motility invasion, and metastasis. This is a publication from Nature. You know, Nature is not a bad address <clears throat> for publications. Or here we have another one from Atzenstein in Tel Aviv. Rand has showed a significant increase in breast cancer cases with no metastasis, and it showed a highly significant increase in metastatic patients compared to controls. The increased propensity towards metastasis is reversible and dependent on Durante's signaling. And this is a very interesting sentence for dentists who are dealing with knee collisions or are eventually cleaning knee collisions. This sentence could mean, possibly, it's just an idea, that a patient with a breast cancer should be monitored for knee collisions and should eventually have removed or cleared these knee collisions to avoid the metastasis. Because you know, these women do not die from the primary tumor, they die from the metastasis. And this is from this uh, publication of Carnup in Nature. Mesenchymal stem cells with tumor stroma promote breast cancer metastasis. Notably, the levels of only one cytokine, Rantus, CCL5 is the modern name for Rantus, CCL5 Rantus, reflecting a synergistic interaction between the mesenchymal stem cells and breast cancer cells as it accumulated to levels 60-fold higher than those produced by poor breast cancer cells cultures. So he also finds very high... Uh, excretion of, uh, of Rantus in the whole breast cancer thing. And this is what you published in Nature. <clears throat> you see CCL5 Rantus 60-fold higher than all the other cytokines, interleukines, and so on. So uh, I apologize. I'm aware that we dentists, we just got uh, used to cytokines like TNF-alpha, and now here we suddenly hear of totally new ones like Rantus and fibroblast growth factor 2. <clears throat> now, if we take the mean of these eight 
breast cancer patients. The mean of runters in these eight breast cancer samples, NICO samples, is 5,737. And we compare it to, breast can uh, to runters levels we find in literature. <clears throat> so here we have a publication from Neva, and uh, he found in 12 breast cancer patients inside the breast cancer tissue, he found a mean level of 1,000. So we are fivefold higher than the Rontes level in NICO than they found in breast cancer tissue. Another publication, Eichbaum, found 797. Same or similar with FGF2. We have here uh, um, healthy breast cancer tissue. <clears throat> it's 14 picograms per milliliter. This is, uh, and these are two uh, cohorts of breast cancer patients, FGF2, 346, 441, and we have a mean of 709. It's not as impressive as Rantas, but also FGF2 is higher than the found directly in the breast cancer tissue. Now, <clears throat> this is uh, some um, citations of the literature. Until now, the mechanisms of so-called tumor elicted inflammation. This is the, the, the term of silent inflammation from the uh, fat, fatty degenerated tissue inside the NICO, which is detected in most solid malignancies, was poorly explained. Well, literature doesn't know exactly what's going on there. The tumor-associated inflammatory reaction may hold the keys for future preventive and therapeutic measures that first and on. And this is the point where we can say, oh my God, eventually we dentists who know about NICO and deal with NICO eventually, we play an important part uh, in an integrative diagnostic and therapeutic aspect of cancer development. Or Harvard University pathologist uh, Dvorak later compared tumors with wounds that never heal, noting the similarities between normal inflammation processes that characterize wound healing and tumorigenesis or tumor formation. And if we look at these typical NICO pictures, this is from Jerry Boko, you know this, <clears throat> and we will look, if we look at these fatty degenerated bone marrow samples, the question comes up, aren't these also wounds that never heal? And aren't we dentists eventually by um, uh, wisdom tooth extractions or just simple tooth extractions, aren't we creating areas in the jawbone which are exactly wounds that never heal. And it's not an acute aspect of wound healing. It's a chronic aspect, which is widely neglected in uh, traditional dentistry. So <clears throat> let's go to another cohort. We have four patients in these 31 uh, cohort. Uh, we have four patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Literature says, by expressing the chemokine runters, synovial fibroblasts particip participate in the ongoing inflammatory process in, R in uh, RA. Ah, also, runters plays an important role. There is increasing evidence suggesting a role for runters in the pathogenesis of RA. Runters was found to be a key molecule in the pathogenesis of all onset cohorts of juvenile RA, or the selective chemoattractant uh, effects of Rantes on leukocytes, it's a chemoattractant <clears throat> uh, cytokine, and it pulls leukocytes into tissues and provokes inflammation there. Identify them as a potentially candidate in mediating selective inflammatory process in R. Now, let's look at our four patients uh, with RA and their contents of runters inside the NICO. 
This is our, again, our normal jawbone mean, three samples. This is one sample with uh, rheumatic arthritis, and he has 5,450 picograms runtus per milliliter compared to 181. This is also a striking difference. This is number two, this is number three, and this is number four. <clears throat> and in literature, they find directly in the synovia of inflamed joints, and they take the, the liquid, the synovial liquid, they found 414 picograms of frontus. So <clears throat> the hypothesis, and the idea always is, here in the NICO of breast cancer patients, of these uh, 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 rheumatic patients, we have a source of runtus. And this runtus production runs over years and 20 years or 10 years, whatever, and nothing happens. But suddenly there takes place um, uh, or a signaling pathway is activated and suddenly you get your inflammation, your rheumatic inflammation in the joints. This is the idea how the connection could be. <clears throat> now, another cohort of our 31 patients were three patients with neurodegenerative diseases. We had up to now one patient with ALS, one patient with MS, and another patient with multiple sclerosis. And again, the comparison of normal jawbone, of Rantus, and the red one is FGF2, you all, again, you see the huge difference compared to this normal jawbone. Now, when we look at literature, here you have our three patients, ALS, MS, and MS number two. And when, you, when we concentrate on the uh, FGF2, because I found in literature no uh, information about high in neurodegenerative diseases, but in FGF2. So we see that in the cerebrospinal fluid of ALS patients, they found 2.74 picograms per milliliter of FGF2. Here we have in FGF2 600, 1700, 156 in the NICO. Or these are, these are two MS patients, serum 16.44, cerebrospinal fluid 16.82, this is what literature tells us, and we have here Seven, uh, 659, 1,756. <clears throat> it doesn't mean, or we cannot say, NICO is producing ALS and MS, or NICO, uh, the run test deriving from NICO is producing breast cancer or RA, but <clears throat> in medicine, if you compare the biological values <clears throat> of these immune mediators in NICO, and if you compare it to the outcome in the cerebrospinal fluid, in the breast cancer tissue itself, it's a striking difference. Now, this is what uh, literature says about FGF2 levels are elevated in the cerebrospinal fluid of multiple sclerosis patients, support the implication of FGF2 in the pathogenesis, pathogenesis of MS, or FGF2 levels in the cerebrospinal fluid of MS patients were significantly higher than controls, or serum, or than the serum, serum FGF2 levels were significantly increased with, within MS patients compared to controls. <clears throat> FGF2 is the other immune mediator, the other cytokine we find highly increased in all our NICO samples. And this is our ALS patient. Again, you see on the two-dimensional uh, orthopandomogram, this is the wisdom tooth area, number 38. In, in, in uh, European, um, you say 17, area 17. And it's totally unconspicuous again. So 
the question comes, comes up, how many ALS patients run around with x-rays like this and nobody uh, gets the suspicion that here is a source of this immune mediator, FGF2, which eventually is part of the pathogenesis of this amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Again, this is the cone beam. Again, the same problem. You can discuss it. This is the uh, alveolar, transalveolar ultrasonography with the cavitat, and you clearly see in this area the bone density is not pretty good. This is this patient. This is uh, uh, left lower area. Yeah, this this ALS patient. This is Rantas, and this is his FGF2 contents compared to the healthy ones. And this is another citation from scientific literature. Increased levels of FGF2 in serum and in cerebrospinal fluid from amyotrophic lateral sclerosis patients that FGF2 is involved in the passive physiological chain in ALS. So in every ALS case, we should think or we should try to find out is there an eco or not? This is uh, the conclusion which gives us that picture. Now, when we compare it to literature, again, this is the FGF2 level of our ALS patient in this NICO area, left lower, <clears throat> with 659 picograms. This is what our ALS patient has in the serum. We also checked for FGF2 in the serum. And this is what they find, what we find, uh, we find 11.1 uh, picograms per milliliter in the literature, in the serum of ALS patients. So we are nearly threefold higher than in the literature. And this is the cerebrospinal fluid in literature 2.74. And if you compare this with the NICO contents of FGF2, this is 300 or 250 fold higher than they have in the cerebrospinal fluid uh, of ALA, real ALS patients. Now, let's come to a conclusion. Nico, first, Nico is, and we tried to prove that, a local site of chronic inflammation in jawbone, although the normal x ray technique does not show. So, number one, NICO is characterized by fatty degenerative softening and osteolysis and osteonecrosis of jawbone. This is what I showed you in this macroscopic pictures. Second, NICO is characterized by resolution of adipocytes, jelly-like substance, metabolic disturbance, and total lack of typical leukocytic inflammation. This is what the pathologist tells us in more than 2,000 histological samples. Third, NICO is characterized biochemically by high levels of pro-inflammatory rantus and growth factor FGF2 in comparison to normal jawbone. I showed you this difference in the graph, in the first graph. Four, NICO is characterized by absence of acute cytokines, such as TNF-alpha and interleukin-6, which explains the painless and cryptic nature of NICO. Because this is the problem. NICO patients, except if they have uh, this uh, facial pain, but normal NICO patients without facial pain reactions on NICO, they have no pain. And they do not go to the dentist and do not have checked uh, for knee collisions. And the doctors look at the x-ray and there is nothing. No, they can't see anything. And they say there isn't anything. This is the problem. And though all these ALS, MS, breast cancer, and rheumatic arthritis patients are treated, well treated, but we forget from the aspect of our integrative uh, therapeutic concept in medicine, 
we forget the chawbone. Now, the second aspect is not a local one, but also a systemic one. Nico, a systemic pathogenic phenomenon. Adipocytes and the necrotic, necrotic parts of fat cells are considered as immunological effective ingredients. The term is silent inflammation. Second, the average of intracellular Ranthus levels in these 31 NICO samples is about threefold as high as Ranthus in breast cancer tissue, in tissue cultures of also cervix carcinomas and endometriosis, didn't show, and extractions of rheumatic synovial liquid. Third, the average of FGF2 values in 31 NICO samples <clears throat> are about twofold as high as FGF2 in breast cancer tissue and about 100 fold as high as in the cerebrospinal fluid from MS patients. And uh, I think this is just uh, an interesting uh, thing. Again, which uh, again, uh, I like to emphasize this, <clears throat> where we dentists can build up in uh, general medicine uh, a position where they acknowledge how important we could be for general health. And this is the reason why I'm very happy. Uh, three, four weeks ago, I got this email. Dear Dr. Lehner, I'm pleased to advise that your manuscript has been accepted for publication by the editor-in-chief for the International Journal of General Medicine Journal and so on, this journal is indexed PubMed and so on. So, <clears throat> the data I showed you, part of the data I showed you, uh, is now published in scientific journals and is part of the scientific uh, discussion. And I think, uh, or I hope you agree with me that these data uh, show that it's really worth to put attention at the phenomenon like NICO. So, as a summary, these data presented support the, the following hypothesis. Inflammation-inducing necrocytes promote pathogenesis of different ID, as immune uh, diseases or systemic diseases, by hyperactive signaling pathways through RUNTAS and FTF2 expression. <clears throat> and made a question mark because we have no direct proof that the Rantus here in the NICO actually uh, uh, has contact to breast cancer or neurodegenerative diseases. But we can presume that NICO-derived Rantus FGF2 might act as a building block for immune diseases, immunological diseases and systemic diseases. Thank you very much for your appreciated attention. Can you hear me? We have time for some questions. Uh, Dr. Lechner will not be at this forum, so if you have a question. I can't really see anything. Uh, there's been some uh, articles published about rankle, and that being in the TNF family and its sure. presence in degenerative bone diseases and then its presence around, like in a periapical lesion, around a necrotic tooth or a root canal tooth. And I didn't know if you could, I mean, the, the link between the, the RA, between it and then the rontus, if you could comment on that. And I guess the follow-up question would be the presence of rontus in a periapical lesion or around a... Uh, whether it's a necrotic or root canal treated tooth, if you've seen or know anything of the presence of rontus in that situation. Yeah, what we, what we regularly consist is that the bone underneath the root canal is nico very often. And then you have the high contents of rontus there. I did not differentiate uh, these samples um, with samples from bone underneath the root canal, 
these samples are all from wisdom tooth areas. But it's a, a good question, and I would say yes, it's the same. Dr. Lechner, I was curious about the, um, the terminology calling these NICO, when, when you characterized them as not being painful. I believe NICO stands for neuralgia inducing cavitations. And um, just like your comment on that. Yeah. And the, the problem is NICO has a double face. It can create the facial neuralgia and it can create these systemic diseases. And you are absolutely right. The term of NICO does not cover these systemic uh, interactions. But the term of NICO, we also can, could say a jawbone cavitations. But the term of NICO, I think the term of NICO, even in Germany, NICO, everybody, everybody knows what NICO is. And, uh, most dentists know. And uh, so we left the term of NICO. Although we are aware and uh, your critics are absolutely right, that the term of NICO does not cover the systemic interference. It's just the local uh, provocation of uh, neuralgia. But NICO is, <sighs> it's wonderful, NICO. <laughs> There's another word. You know, I'm from Germany, and German, Germans like to, ma to, to form long, long words. And uh, I think one of uh, the ability here in this country is to make short, precise words. I've not had an opportunity to use a cavitat, the uh, machine you were using. Uh, I was curious what, uh, obviously you trust the cavitat, you, know, you use it to diagnose. Do you find that it's very accurate as far as helping you to identify the, the lesions? Mm -hmm. And um, I was wondering where someone could get Rantus level testing done on the contents of the lesions. Yeah, uh, first part of your question, uh, or I was afraid of this question, you know Cavitat vanished, <clears throat> it's off the market. Uh, in the moment, uh, I'm developing a, a, a proceed instrument which is able to measure bone density. Yeah? Uh, <clears throat> this is just how dense is the bone. And this, to answer this question properly, is also important for any implants you do. Yeah? <clears throat> and the second is uh, Rantas. Uh, I don't know which lab I have. My friend in Berlin is an immunologist, and he has a, a big lab in Berlin, and they do this Rantas measuring. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like you to comment on, on the, uh, I'm over here. Ah, OK. All right. That's it's it's the light. So. You, you, you mentioned in your talk there about tumor necrosis factor not being <laughs> elevated at all in a, in a NICO or in, in a lesion, in a necrotic lesion. On the other hand, there's scientific papers showing that there's an elevation in tumor necrosis factor at apical lesions or radiolucencies. Could you, would you say that's a different stage of degeneration that we're seeing, and that's why we see an elevation versus in a NICO where we have necrotic tissue? Yeah. I think it's a different clinical stage. <clears throat> that means when the bacteria go down to the apex, let's say, yeah, and you check the bone down there, you find high levels of uh, TNF alpha because this is an acute inflammation. And we have a lot of patients which come with a sore tooth because of this acute inflammation. And the other part is this silent inflammation in the, inside these, let's say, toothless jawbone areas, like the wisdom tooth areas. You mentioned you're developing a, uh, an instrument, but we already have one. We have a cone beam CT, which we could measure bone density with. Isn't that a, a great tool to identify these lesions? Uh, a cone beam? CBCT. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, we have a cone beam, and, and, and we love it, we have it for, for years. And um, the, the question is always the interpretation. I have cone beams from other radiologists, and they say there is, it's okay. The jawbone is perfect. And we find a huge nickel lesion. Yeah. Um, the problem, uh, even um, uh, 
the problem is that even in, 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 in uh, the, the cone beam uh, uh, X-ray, we have an, so an absorption of um, um, uh, of the uh, X-ray of the radiation by heavy metal contents. This is what I didn't show you. Uh, we checked for heavy metal contents in these Nico areas, and we have high levels of silver, mostly silver. It's not so much mercury, but we have higher levels of silver and even gold. So the uh, enriched heavy metals inside might absorb, even in the cone, bo cone beam, the radiation. Dr. Lechner, um, do you think that... Over here. No, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> do, you, do you think that uh, aspiration of these lesions uh, and examination of cytokines and discovery of Rantis might become a field test, a uh, diagnostic test, because uh, the Cavitat machine is off the market and shows no sign of returning. And uh, uh, although I know that that testing for yeah. cytokines like this requires deep freezing the, uh, the samples immediately. Yeah. yeah, this is a good question. Well, you see, in many, many years, <clears throat> we did only 31 samples because it's pretty expensive to do this Luminex analysis for cytokines. And um, uh, what we try to do is, in the moment, uh, to check runtus in the serum. And if, if runtus in the serum is high, there you get a diagnostic, uh, yeah, uh, a diagnostic hint that there might be a knee collision. But this is the, the, whole, um, the whole research I showed you, is to um, uh, make us aware the position of chronic, of painless chronic processes and in silent inflammation in jawbone uh, how far we are connected to systemic diseases. And for instance, breast cancer, nobody knows, at least in, in Germany, why the breast cancer uh, curve is going up and up uh, with high incidence. So this could be possibly an ex explanation for that. You didn't mention bacteria at all in, in these lesions. So what, what do you find as to bacterial content? And, and can you uh, comment on ozone as a, sort of a, a way to, that is being used to treat these? Yeah. Um, the bacteria, there are a lot of researches uh, about the contents of anaer anaerobic bacteria in literature, especially from, from the United States. Um, we didn't do that, but I was quite happy to, to find this DNA lab here and uh, we will try to find uh, bacteria in this knee collision with this test. Uh, second, we do a lot of ozone. Uh, we wash the, the, after we have taken out the knee tissue, we wash it with ozone, ozonized water, we give ozone in it. But not to take out the knee collision and just to inject ozone might help in certain cases. But the problem is that what you eventually saw in this uh, in, the, uh, in the consistency of this NICO, it's, if you look at a, a tissue like this, no, you know, would have been one. If you look at, uh, on a tissue like this, there is no ability, there is no ability to cure itself because the histiocytes are totally blocked. Uh, so the, the central posi position of self-healing is blocked. And you might get a relief in certain cases with the ozone injection. But uh, in all the cases we tried, we had a relapse. I'm sorry, but the surgery, I think the surgery is necessary. Thank you. Have you been able to make a, a correlation that uh, you're comfortable with in the location of the NECO lesions as related to previously infected sites, whether it be an abscessed tooth or root canal therapy, uh, or in this case, just an extracted wisdom tooth site? What is your clinical correlation of the locations? Yeah, <clears throat> I think the, the, the biggest 
uh, the, the sites of the biggest interest should be the wisdom tooth areas because we always had juvenile, rheumatis, uh, juvenile uh, rheumatis, uh, rheumatic arthritis. Uh, we have, we have a 19-year-old patient. Uh, she lost her consciousness about seven times a day and fell over uh, unconscious. And five minutes later, she got up again. And this continued for, for one year. And this one year, she was in, in Austria in a university clinic. And the outcome was a psych psychological um, treatment. And we cleaned all four wisdom tooth areas two years ago. And since then, she's completely healthy. So <clears throat> the, the, the actual procedure uh, just to take out all four wisdom teeth and in general anesthesia and to, to give the patient antibiotics for 14 days and that's done, <clears throat> I think this is a, a mistake. Of course, you find needles in every part of them. But if you, have a, a, if you take out a cyst or if you have an abscess, then you have a well-functioning functioning immune system in this area. And this is not uh, uh, really the, the site where we have to expect the NICO. Could be, but it's different. Always where no pain, no infection, no abscess, no cyst. This is uh, the uh, preliminary necrocytes. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. I have two questions back here by the podium. Uh -huh. Okay. One, are you doing any post-op therapies, follow-up therapies as far as uh, just allowing normal clotting, any protein-rich placement, I mean, protein-rich, plasma-rich pro protein uh, placements or grafting. And the second part is, have you gone back into any of these as follow-up or done any post-surgical testing into these necocytes that you did originally? Yeah. Well, we use this uh, palatal, uh, in, uh, palatal in enriched serum and inject it immediately after the, uh, the NECO surgery in this site to um, enhance the bone uh, growing by these um, growth factors. Uh, second, uh, we do a, second, we do a lot of... Um, we do a lot of... Uh, uh, infusions around it, the, the big ozone, the major ozone therapy where we inject ozone, ozonized blood, we give high doses of vitamin C, we give uh, glutathione, this is a routine standard infusion like this, three to four days after the surgery or eventually even before the surgery. And we check the sites uh, with the cavitat machine, with the uh, ultrasound, uh, uh, in the lower jawbone after three months and in the upper after five, six months. Uh, and uh, what we try to avoid is direct bone grafting. If you have a cavitation like this cleaned, we never put in bone grafting. We wait for three months and do the bone grafting afterwards. Why? Because if you put in this foreign material, you provoke the body, the immune system, to a, to a we call it counter-reaction, a biological counter-reaction. And the body should have, uh, we want to give relief to the body from any inflammatory provocation. If you fill in uh, bone grafting immediately after the, uh, the NECO surgery, you provoke the body to the reaction to integrate this bone grafting material. And this is not good for the systemic aspect in our eyes. It's okay. Thank you. Uh, doctor, um, what is your use? I'm over here. Uh, have you used electrodermal screening? Uh, it's uh, EAV by Vol for detecting the site and then checking the site after surgery to be sure you have it clean. And what I've found in the cavitations I've done, when the metals are in the teeth, 
we don't get good healing. So we put in compatible filling materials first. Have you had any experience with that? Uh, the last sentence you said is a very good idea. Uh, this is the reason why we do for 20 years now totally, total metal-free dentistry. And I was the first one in Germany to introduce zirconium dioxide or zirconium oxide uh, for uh, crowns and bridges. And uh, to the first part of your question, uh, yes, I did EIV for 20 years. I even knew Dr. Fall personally shortly before he died. And uh, EIV is a wonderful method of this electrodermal screening to check for knee collisions. But um, today with, uh, with, the, with this uh, transalveolar uh, ultrasonography, we have a, a better met method and a more objective uh, method than uh, to diagnose with uh, EIV. But if you can do EIV, which you need, uh, I hope you agree with me, you need a, a long practice to be really safe in this. It's a wonderful method. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Based on your experience, what percentage of teeth that have been uh, extracted like wisdom teeth result in NECO lesions? Based on the things you've seen with your testing and clinical experience. Oh, excuse me, I, I didn't uh, pick up the first part of your question. Uh, based on uh, the experience you've had, what percentage of like people having their wisdom teeth extracted end up with cavitation lesions in those areas? How many, uh, what percentage of people don't heal appropriately from the initial extraction? Oh, uh, I, I can say this because we only get the, uh, the failed cases. Yeah? Okay. But a very interesting aspect is not only the wisdom tooth area, I, uh, but is the retromolar area number, we say this is tooth number eight, six, seven, eight in European counting, and we say it's the number nine area. And this is a very interesting uh, aspect where you find uh, very few information in literature. And this is probably the, the, a, 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 a not developed germ of a ninth tooth. And uh, uh, in some famous, in one famous uh, uh, German football player, uh, he had nausea and um, uh, he couldn't play anymore. We just cleaned this area number nine because he had a wonderful tooth number eight and the symptoms were gone. Uh, so today in my eyes, <clears throat> if you remove a wisdom tooth here and do not check for the number nine area, that's a mistake. You should do that. And then you have a better chance that the whole area is healing properly. Thank you. Last question? Yes. Yeah, he just gave it to me. Thank you. Um, having done over, well over 5,000 cavitation surgeries myself, I've come to the conclusion that these problems are created by dentists that use epinephrine and that it's the epinephrine that causes the um, you know, lack of oxygen going to the osteocytes. And if dentists would then do extractions without epinephrine, we'd have a lot less of these cavitational osteonecrosis situations. Can you comment on that? Yes, yes, I totally agree with you. There is a lot of literature about the clotting, how important um, it is not to have the clotting inside these, uh, uh, these areas, and I totally agree with you. Uh, this might be, I would like to say this might be one reason, yeah, uh, beside the total neck like that a wound like this needs a general support uh, by vitamin C, by uh, ozone, whatever. You made a comment about waiting three months before you put graft material in. Well, at three months, these are usually more than 50% healed. And at six months, they're completely healed, especially if you do all of the things that you say, and I do, you know, the ozone and everything. Then why would you consider putting an artificial graft material into the site anyway? Yeah, we, che we check it, and if we get a good, a good finding in the... We do not EIV, but we do a similar uh, kinesiology uh, testing procedure. 
uh, we, we ask the body first, and then we, we do the transalveolar uh, ultrasonography. Mm -hmm. And if both things say it's okay, the body is happy with it, then we do the grafting. If not, which happens, right. quite often, we wait. And we give the, the body further support. This is an interesting aspect anyway. Yeah? Right. To have a system where you can, if the patient is coming and says, oh, doctor, you made the knee go uh, four weeks ago, and my knee was gone immediately, my sore knee. And now it starts again. What do you know? You know you gave a relief to the body, right? but the body has not the power to heal uh, this permanently, uh, perfectly. Thank and then you. you need, the body needs support. Mm -hmm. I do not say surgery heals everything, Nico surgery heals everything. This is not the truth. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lechner. Let's give all the speakers from this morning a nice Thank round of applause. Thank you very much.